Number one, please, Ms. Amanda, may the Lord add his blessing to his word. All who receive and are filled with the Holy Spirit have the ability, <coughs> excuse me, to prophesy. Amen. All who receive and are filled with the Holy Spirit have the ability to prophesy. And I'm going to give you the definition of prophesying. Give me A number one. Look at this. This is Peter speaking. He says in uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, he says, But this was spoken by the prophet Joel, in the last day it shall be, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, yeah. and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Yeah. Be pleased. Notice this. He even takes it further. He says, even on my men servants or slaves and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall what? They shall what? They shall prophesy. Now this was spoken 2,000 years ago, my beloved friends. 2,000 years ago, this word was spoken by Peter. Amen? Well, let's continue. Give me D, please. What is the word prophecy mean in the Greek. And this is where a lot of God's people get a little bit shy about the word prophecy. Because as soon as you say prophecy, they go, well, man, I don't know about predicting the future. Well, it means that, but it means also something else. Let's read. Prophecy in the Greek means speaking under the influence of divine inspiration. Notice this. With or without reference to future events. Amen. 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 With or without. So, what does prophecy mean? Speaking under divine inspiration. You're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Right? With or without uh, reference to future events. To prophesy, to make inspired utterances. So in other words, a person can get up in this church and begin to speak and I will go, wow, they're prophesying and most people will think, well, they didn't say anything about the future. Well, you don't have to. Now, you can, you can say something about the future, right? But it doesn't necessarily have to be that. All that means is when you prophesy is you are in direct contact with the Holy Spirit and He's using you as a mouthpiece to speak to God's people about what He wants for them right now. Amen. Right now. Not 2,000 years ago. You know, so somebody said to me, well, you know, God already stopped, uh, God already stopped speaking and all, everything's in the Word. You know, I said, so you're going to do what uh, God said to Peter to do? And they couldn't answer that question. Well, God, he didn't speak it to you, he spoke it to Peter. Good Lord, you know, well, I'm going to take Peter's word. No, no, he spoke it to Peter. What is he speaking to you? Amen. Right now. Amen. Amen. And the gift of uh, prophecy or the prophetic word will give you that. And that's the beauty of it. And that's why the devil hates people so much who believe in this word. Because the church, there's a bunch of denominations who don't believe in prophecy. They're saying, you know what? They're saying prophecy no longer exists. Miracles don't exist. Healings don't exist. All that stuff uh, ended when the last apostle died. They say it's done. If you want to know what God is speaking, you go to his word. You go, well, yeah, well, bless the Lord. But I want to know what he's speaking now. Amen. 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 Well, let's see the definition. <coughs> Excuse me. Of prophetic ministry. Give me. E, please. Thank you, Miss Amanda. Prophetic ministry. Whenever a person speaks forth under the divine inspiration of what God is saying to others now. Amen? Now. They are exercising prophetic ministry or prophesying. Amen. All right? And let me tell you, the devil hates people that believe in this. The devil hates people who move in this. And let me tell you what stops God's people from really moving in the gifts of the Spirit is that they'll tap into that spirit of prophecy or they'll say something to somebody and maybe move in a, in a word of, uh, of the future or not even that. And the enemy comes against them and tells them, if you don't be quiet, I'm going to put you in your place. 
And God's people go, whoa, okay. And he doesn't do that by appearing to you in, in, like a black cloud over you. What he does is he sends people your way. He sends people your way. And through these people, they'll let you, he'll let you know. Oh, so you're one of those that believes in the prophecy. Oh, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. You know, what kind of church is that? Cuckoo. Yeah. And he starts attacking you, but it is because prophetic people and those who believe in prophetic prophecies or the, uh, the gift of prophecy, I'm telling you, man, they're dangerous to the devil. They're a threat to the devil. Mm -hmm. Amen. So point number one. All who receive and are filled with the Holy Spirit have the ability to prophesy. Amen. Uh, give me C, please, Miss Amanda. Look at this. This is Acts 21. This is cool. On the next day, uh, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven. He was a one of the seven deacons that were picked in the early church, uh, and stayed with him. Now notice verse 9. This man had four virgin daughters who what? Prophesied. Who prophesied. Amen. Amen. Now the virgin weren't there. Uh, what, what they're trying to tell you is they weren't married. All right? There's, it's not like, oh, they were holy because they were virgins. No, they weren't married, and that's what the scripture is saying. Amen that uh, they weren't married and they were still with him. But notice this, what did they do? Prophesied. They prophesied, and this is in the book of uh, Acts chapter 21. So you have men prophesying, you have women prophesying. You, it, it doesn't matter man or woman. God said, I'm gonna pour out my spirit upon all flesh, upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Amen? Your sons and daughters shall speak under divine inspiration. And at times, God said to his people, they're going to predict the future. Mm. Amen. Say praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, it's good. It's good to believe that. Point number two. <coughs> the apostle Peter gave Jesus a prophetic word or a prophecy. Amen. And what the apostle Peter uh, gave a prophetic word to Jesus and he said you are the Christ the son of the living God before this in this scripture in Matthew 16 uh, they really weren't sure who he was amen and let's read so you can understand a little bit better about what uh, happened give me uh, let's see for a under point number two when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and we're going to talk about Caesarea Philippi in a, little, in a little while. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? Uh, who, who, that I am the son of man? Uh, they said, well, some say that you are John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and others say Jeremiah. Or you're one of the prophets. Be please. He said to them, well, I understand that, adding some words to the Lord. Uh, but he said, who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, say, he's given Jesus a prophetic word. <laughs> say, Jesus is receiving a prophetic word from one of his disciples. That is incredible. Amen. That anybody would prophesy to the Son of God at that age. Amen. Right? I mean, he was in the prime of his ministry. Simon Peter replied, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Notice what Jesus answered. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For notice this. He says, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Amen. This that you have just stated didn't come from your brain. It didn't come from man's knowledge. All right. He said, notice this, he said, flesh and blood has, uh, has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So here you have Peter, a disciple, prophesying to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is incredible, folks. Amen. Amen. That is incredible. 
And Jesus said, wow, Peter, you know, uh, flesh and blood didn't tell you any of this. Uh, this is not man's traditions or man's knowledge. He said, my heavenly father revealed that to you. I remember the first time that I prophesied to Dr. McKinney. Man, I was so scared. And the Lord spoke a word to me, and we were in prayer. And I'm like, I'm about, uh, and the, you know, we, we prayed for about 10 minutes, and I got the prophetic word from the very beginning. And I said, oh, I'm, not, I'm, not, no, I'm not telling Dr. McKinney anything. I said, no way, no way, Jose. And I was pushed and pushed, and I thought, Lord, if I'm wrong, God, you know, the pastor's going to kill me, man. And I thought, well, I thought, no, I'm not wrong, because I, I know I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I prophesied to Dr. McKinney, uh, and I remember I said something about some books. And he turned to me and said, wow, he said, God just been speaking to me about that, Brother Michael. And I went, whoo, thank you, Jesus, amen. amen. You know, so here, Peter prophesies, give me point number two, the Apostle Peter gives Jesus a prophetic word that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And notice that there was no future events foretold. Right. Peter didn't say, yeah, and you're gonna reign as king or this and that, or I see you doing this. No, he just stated who Jesus was. He receives divine, divine information, and he spoke it. And if you do that, then you are literally prophesying. Amen. Amen. So if Peter can prophesy, say amen. amen. Can, uh, slaves can prophesy. Back in those days, there were slaves, yes. Women slaves, yes. Men slaves, yes. Uh, uh, women, men, you know. I mean, we've even had, I remember, uh, Pastor Gracie, that I think that even our children have prophesied a few words to us when they were little. Amen. And I'm like, wow, man, this is crazy. You know, and they were under the power of the Holy Spirit and prophesying, and we knew that God was speaking to them about what He wanted us to do. Amen? So, point number two, the Apostle Peter gave Jesus a prophetic word that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, let's see what happens. <coughs> point number three. Notice what happens here. Point number three. The Lord Jesus now gave or gives the Apostle Peter a prophetic word. So first, he receives a prophetic word from uh, Peter. Peter tells Jesus and releases a prophetic word or, or prophesies. Uh, point number three, the Lord gave the Apostle Peter a prophetic word that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Notice this. A, please, under point number three. <coughs> This is after Peter has said, Oh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, uh, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. Notice what he says. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Amen? Amen. Say, Jesus is prophesying. Jesus is prophesying. And not only that, he's speaking about future events. Amen? Amen? He says, I tell you this, Peter, that on this rock, I will build my church. What rock? On the rock of prophecy. Amen. On the rock of what Peter said to Jesus. Hey, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen? Amen. And some say it's Peter, but Peter means something else. It means a small stone. The word rock here is a humongous rock. It's not the same as a small stone. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, what rock? The rock of revelation, the prophecy that was spoken by Peter about Jesus being the Son, the Christ, the Son of the living God. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the word there is mostly translated hell, but the actual Greek word is Hades. I will build my church, and the gates <coughs> of Hades shall not prevail against it. Amen? And then he says this, he's continuing, he's still prophesying. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. So not only did Peter 
Point number three, please. Not only did Peter prophesy to Jesus and he said, look, you are the son. Uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus says, well, now what? You know what? Let me prophesy to you. And let me prophesy to you and about some future events. And Jesus says to him, look, I tell you that I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades is not going to prevail against it. Somebody say amen. amen. And he says, I give you the keys. Where are keys? Well, keys is authority. If I give you the keys to my house, you can go in my house. If I give you the keys to my car, you can get into my car. I've given you authority. Amen. So he said, I give you the keys or authority of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So point number three, Jesus prophesies to the apostle Peter and says, look, the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Amen. Now, Hades is the realm of the dead. Hades, uh, the Greeks and the Romans called it the underworld. Amen? Amen? The underworld. And so there's a lot of activity in Hades. If there wasn't no activity in Hades, and it's not unified, it's not it doesn't have no governmental structure it doesn't have no uh, you know no sense of authority or who's in charge well then how can it come against the church amen no there that means that hades is is hades is doing what it's supposed to do it's it, it's got you know satan has uh, demons in certain situations and that have certain authority and the whole kingdom of darkness the whole kingdom of Satan works together mm -hmm. Jesus said when they accused him of casting out demons through Beelzebub Jesus said how is it possible for Satan to cast out Satan he said if that happens then his kingdom is not going to stand amen and when Jesus said that to Peter, that is, he was saying, he was saying, look, there's, there's a realm of the dead. There is a kingdom of darkness. There is a kingdom uh, of devils and demons and, and, and people who die and don't receive the Lord. And they go into that realm of the dead uh, kingdom. He said, this kingdom is going to try to stop the church. It's going to try to prevent the church from doing what it's supposed to. But he said to Peter, but I'm telling you right now that the gates of the underworld, the gates of the realm of the dead, the gates of the kingdom or the gates of Hades, he said they're not going to prevail against the church. Amen. Somebody say amen. Praise amen. the Lord. Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus prophesied that? I'm glad because when the enemy attacks us and when the enemy begins to defeat us, he, 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 como dice, te saque el aire. You go, good Lord, man, help me, Jesus. These power, these demons are too strong. These, these powers are too strong. You go, no, wait, wait, wait. You say to yourself, no, Jesus prophesied. That the gates of Hades would not prevail against this church. Amen. So you get back where you belong, you foul devil. Amen. You're not going to stop me from praying. You're not going to stop me from reading the word. You're not going to stop me from being a Christian. Right. Somebody say amen. 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 <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about the Caesarea Philippi. As I was studying this uh, yesterday... Uh, I noticed that uh, Caesarea Philippi, which is a region, that is only mentioned twice in the scripture. And both times that it mentioned, it is mentioned in Matthew 16, and it's also mentioned in the book of Mark. And both times that it's mentioned, it's the same story. Okay? So then from that, and it's not mentioned in any, in any other gospel, so from that you can say, well, wow, then Jesus basically went to Caesarea Philippi one time. Amen? Let's go one time. So then you start studying, <clears throat> and you go, well, let me, let me see what Bible scholars say about this subject. And you find out that Bible scholars agree that Jesus only went to this region of Caesarea Philippi one time. 
they say that it was about 40 to 35 to 40 miles uh, north of Jerusalem, or north of, excuse me, Galilee. Amen. All right? So this is where Jesus takes him in Matthew 16, and this is where Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And that's when Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But let me tell you something very interesting that I found out about Caesarea Philippi. Amen? Give me A under point number four. The city of Caesarea Philippi was where the Greeks and the Romans both built sanctuaries there because of the cave of Pan. All right? To the pagan mind, the cave in Caesarea Philippi created a gate to the underworld. All right? When the underworld is basically Hades. All right? To them, to the Greeks and the Romans uh, who uh, 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 built, you know, sanctuaries in this area of the Caesarea Philippi. All right? So... To the pagan mind, the cave, the cave in Caesarea Philippi created a gate to the underworld where fertility gods live during the winter. And I saw some pictures of these buildings 2,000 years ago, and my God, you, you'd think, uh, you know, it was a, a Disney World park. Uh, just incredible, beautiful. Uh, pictures, right, of, of what the Romans and the Greek dis, did in this area. Now you go and it's just, just a bunch of ruins. But it's still there. This area is still there. Amen? And the Romans built some sanctuaries to these, uh, to the to the god of Pan. Alright? B, please, what happened in that area of Caesarea Philippi, and why did the Greeks and Romans Worship there, and what did they do? Be please. Uh, the historians say that uh, these people, the Romans and the Greeks, that they committed detestable acts, including prostitution and sexual interaction between humans and goats. Amen. Say, oh Lord. Amen. Say, oh Lord. Bestiality. They committed in that area. This is historical stuff. Amen. They committed detestable acts including prostitution, sexual interaction between humans and goats to worship these false gods. All right? See, please, who was the god of Pan? All right? Pan is the Greek god of nature who watches over shepherds and their flocks, which does not have the appearance of a normal man. The bottom half of Pan, the bottom half of his body was like a goat, and the upper part of his body was like a man. You're probably seeing his picture somewhere. Have man, have goat, right? Well, that's Pan, right? And that's what they worship, these Greeks and these Romans, all right? So the bottom half of his body was like a goat, and the upper part of his body is like a man. He is often depicted with horns on his head, and his face, <coughs> excuse me, is usually very unattractive. Okay, so then you have this area, Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi, where the mega, the 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 the, the gate, I, I guess, what well, Jesus called it, the gate of Hades. So apparently, Jesus saw something or felt something because he says the gates of Hades is not going to prevail against the church. Now this is Greek and Roman religion and what historians say is that well you know they worship this and worship that and, but we all know that all religions come from demonic demons right? All false religions may I say comes from demonic demons. 
So it is interesting because Jesus takes his disciples there to Caesarea Philippi one time only in the, throughout his three and a half years of ministry. Well, some say three. Three years of ministry. He takes them there. Do you think it was a coincidence? I mean, many people would go, yeah, those stupid Romans and those stupid Greeks, they do detestable things with goats and all that, but good Lord, they are messed up. Well, maybe they were messed up, but in the spirit realm, something was there. Amen? Something was there. Right? Uh, Jesus says to one of the churches in the book of Revelation, He says, look, I know your works and I know what you're going through because the, your church is right in the middle of the synagogue of Satan. Good Lord, what was He saying? There's some major powers in that area. Synagogue of Satan. You know, so there's a major powers, He said to the church there in Revelation chapter 2, one of the churches, I don't remember the name, uh, he said, and look, the, the, the synagogue of Satan is right there. So what was he saying here to his disciples? He takes him to Caesarea Philippi, Philippi for one time only, according to the scripture and according to Bible scholars. And there in that area where the power of hell resided. When we went to Kenya... One of the healing services that we had, a, a little girl could not, uh, could not hear. So if she couldn't hear, she couldn't speak. Right? Well, the Lord heals the little girl. She was about seven, eight years old. The Lord heals the little girl because some friends of her uh, heard that there was some healing evangelist there in the area, which was us. We were having meetings. And her friends brought her to the meeting without permission from the mom, right? Well, <clears throat> the man of God, you know, we, we prayed for her and prophesied and called things that are not as they were. And one of the ministers from that area, uh, he said, he said, I have a testimony, I have a testimony. And we all got quiet, you know, and we said, well, what's going on? And he said, the little girl can hear. And so, you know, he began to do, make sounds, and the little girl was like, wow, you know, and, you know, but she couldn't speak, right? Because she had been deaf uh, all her life. Well, mama finds out that the little girl is in this meeting, and she is mad. She is, I mean, she is mad. And is yelling and screaming, how dare they take her little girl? Because she thought that the ministers, which was us, she thought that we had gone and taken her little girl from her house, which it wasn't. It wasn't that. Her friends had bought that little girl over. And so she's mad and, you know, and cursing and all that in, 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 in their own language. And the minister there said to, to the lady, just stop. Just, just stop. And then she, the lady grabbed her little girl and hugged her and kissed her and all that. She, he, the minister said, just stop. He said, just wait. And the minister said to the, to the little girl, mama. And the little girl went, mama. Well, the mama fainted. She just lost it. Because her little girl had never said the word mama. And she was like, I said seven or eight something years old, something like that. Right? So instead of uh, jumping up and down and being angry, well, she, she was, you know, blessed that her little girl could hear and she had said mama for the first time. Amen. It was an incredible miracle. Amen. But let me tell you what happened the night before. Mm. See, the night before, in our hotel rooms, I was staying with another minister. Uh, what happened was that about 2 o'clock in the morning, this power appears to us in the bedroom, right? We had a ceiling fan uh, right in between, right? No, no, no. There was a ceiling fan, and it was right under where that other minister who was sharing the room, his bed was right under that, and then my bed was a little bit to the side. Well, this power appears in the corner of the room and says to me, uh... I'm not going to give up any territory tomorrow. He said, I don't care who you guys are. You have no authority. 
And I said, well, I don't know who you are, but I don't have authority, but Jesus does, and he sent us. Right? I'm talking to this power like I'm talking to you, but it's a demonic spirit. Amen. Right? So then what happened is that he got real angry. This power got real angry, and the ceiling fan began to increase and increase and increase and increase, and I thought, my God, this one is just going to fall and hurt, you know, my brother. You know, crazy. So that happened the previous night, and then the next evening was when the little girl was healed. Yeah. You getting it now? Yes, yeah. Amen.